I'd like to welcome everybody to the 37th Fungus Fair from the Fungus Federation of Santa Cruz. Um, this is a wonderful club. If you're not already a member, I highly encourage you to join. They're a very friendly group, um, and they know lots and lots about fungus. And I would say they certainly know how to put on a fair, don't you? Yeah. All right. So. Now, the Fungus Federation motto is they put the fun in fungus. However, it's not all fun and games when you're out there collecting mushrooms for the table. As we know, there's sometimes a downside. Now, most of the time, most of the poisonings that occur are, are fairly simple poisonings where you have an upset stomach. I mean, nobody likes to throw up, but that's not life-threatening. Why we're here today is to talk to you about the truly serious mushroom poisonings that occur when one eats a mushroom that contains amatoxin, like these mushrooms here, the Amanita phylloides, um, which is a non-native species uh, that was inadvertently introduced from Europe to California uh, back in the late 1940s and unfortunately found California very much to its liking, like so many transplants here, and it now can be found across the state of California, everywhere there is live oak, even onto the Channel Islands, and we have just discovered in the last couple years that it's actually switching hosts here, not just with a live oak, but it's now with pine and tan oak and goodness knows what all else. It occurs with about 12 different tree species around the world. Um, there's a second deadly amanita that uh, is involved in poisonings here in California. That's the white destroying angel amanita ocreata, but amanita phylloides is the number one cause of deadly mushroom poisonings. Uh, my name is Debbie Vies. I'm a member of the Fungus Federation and also the co-founder of the Bay Area Mycological Society. And I'm a huge fan of Amanitas in general. And in fact, my nickname is Amanita Rita. So I walk my talk. Um, I would like to introduce our panel to you today. We have Dr. Todd Mitchell. Um, who has been pioneering the use of intravenous psilobinin here. He has convinced the FDA, def, FDA to start clinical trials, um, and this is very exciting. It's been in use in Europe to treat these very serious amatoxin poisonings for about 20 years, and he'll talk a lot more about that. Then we have Dr. Dennis Benjamin, who comes to us from the Pacific Northwest. He is the author of a widely used book on mushroom poisonings, mushrooms, poisons, and panaceas. Um, it's a book that is useful for both the layman and physicians, talks all about poisonings and some of the history of mushrooms and eating of mushrooms. And then finally, we have Henry Young, who is a longtime member of the Fungus Federation, one of their top taxonomist, and he works closely with local poison control when folks get poisoned here by mushrooms. He tries to help them ID those mushrooms. So we're going to start with Henry Young, who's going to talk to you about how to avoid poisoning in the first place. Good afternoon. And how to avoid poisoning in the first place? Get to know your mushrooms. It's that simple. It sounds simple, and it is. But getting to know your mushrooms can be a little bit more challenging because identification involves a number of different things. Uh, there are several characteristics that each mushroom has, and all of those characteristics need to match the identification of the mushroom. Otherwise, odds are, odds are you don't have exactly the mushroom that you think you have. Uh, books like David Aurora's Mushrooms Demystified work off of what are called dichotomous keys. You're given a choice, A or B. The mushroom either has characteristic A or characteristic B. If you choose one of those, you go to the next couplet. They're, uh, the dichotomous couplets, um, thus dichotomous. Um, at each couplet, you make a choice which characteristic matches your mushroom. If you get to a couplet where 
neither characteristic matches your mushroom, you made a mistake, back up the chain. And you need to retrace your steps and work your way through. This is one of the things that we teach in the Fungus Federation. Phil Carpenter teaches identification classes where you can learn how to use the books and references in this manner. So as Debbie said, and I, I also encourage people that really want to get to know mushrooms, join a local orga organization like the Fungus Federation and participate, take the class, come to the meetings and uh, listen to the speakers that we have. Uh, we always get a great number of very excellent speakers from around the country. Uh, we have two of them here today. So what I'm gonna do here briefly is give you an introduction to the alpha ammonitin uh, toxin that's contained in Amanita phylloides and introduce you to a few of the other mushrooms in the area that contain this toxin. We have Amanita phylloides um, up on screen right now. Uh, these are a couple of young buttons just emerging from the ground. Uh, one of the characteristics on this mushroom is the green color, look, color to the cap. This color is quite variable. Uh, as you can see, the mushrooms we have here are a little uh, paler green than the mushroom I have uh, on screen. I've seen them with brown tones. I've, I've seen them with more white towards the margin and just a very little amount of green uh, actually at the center of the cap. The alpha aminate molecule for the chemists in the audience and the molecular formula, should you be that interested in it, here we have it. Um, I'll let uh, Dr. Benjamin go into the, the real deep science on this. And here is a uh, stick figure of the molecule, the chemistry involved, <coughs> briefly. And what the molecule does is it inter interferes with uh, polymerase II and messenger RNA, which is required for your liver to regenerate. And it shuts down that process, which is why the liver is the first organ to be involved in an amanita poisoning. And here's an image of the molecule in the polymerase too. And then the mushrooms. Amanita phylloides and ocreata, as Debbie mentioned. Um, that's phylloides. Uh, got ocreata in the next slide. Lepiota species, uh, especially the small woodland lepiotas, uh, contain the toxin. Uh, Gallerina marginata, which uh, in the tech, most books right now is still called Gallerina autumnalis. It's been renamed. And the bottom slide is a cluster of, or a group of Amanita phylloides, and it's slightly different stature than we normally see. The symptoms of amatoxin uh, poisoning. The onset is delayed. It's six to 24 hours after you've ingested the mushroom. Um, <clears throat> but within, and what happens is you feel a little nauseous and you start to feel better and you think, okay, not a big deal. About 24 hours after you've eaten the mushroom, the vomiting and diarrhea starts, cramps kick in. You can also have, uh, short, sometime after that, another feeling uh, 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 where you're feeling better and uh, you say, okay, done with that. Then you hit li liver and kidney failure and eventually death. Now this is in an untreated condition. If you don't get help, um, these are the symptoms and the progression. Uh, what we'll find is that uh, early detection of the ingestion and treatment can avoid most of these symptoms. And here we have three <coughs> other uh, mushrooms that contain the toxin. Uh, this is an example of the Amanita ocreata. It's a very robust mushroom, comes up in the spring, more white in it than the Amanita phylloides, uh, can have a slightly brown center to the cap. Uh, the annulus on this is uh, pretty well torn away, but it, it does have an annulus as well, like the Amanita phylloides. The 
mushroom on the right here is Lepiota magnospora, formerly known as Lepiota clipiolaria. Uh, they're a small woodland mushroom, and not, not much you'd be looking for that you would uh, mistake it for. Uh, small and fragile, probably not likely that you would collect it for the table, but good to know just the same. And the mushroom in the bottom center is uh, Lepiota atradisca. It's got this dark uh, center to the cap and the marginate uh, stem. It's got a very fine, movable veil on the, on the stem. And I think that's the end of those. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank Santa Cruz for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to be back in the world of uh, mycology, I was sort of isolated for a decade in Texas, where in 10 years I saw one uh, chanterelle. Is that better? OK. Uh, but now I'm back in the Pacific Northwest, and it wasn't soon after I arrived back in the little town of Kielum. Some of you may know this area. It, it was featured in the uh, TV series Northern Exposure. Uh, the town of Roslyn. And it feels like, actually, this year that we're living in Alaska. Just briefly to go over a few things that Henry said, the, the toxin that we're talking about is a cyclopeptide, and it inhibits this <coughs> enzyme that's absolutely crucial for the production of all proteins. So if you don't make protein, cells die. And it doesn't matter which cells. It just happens that the GI tract, obviously when you eat it, is the first thing that gets hit. The toxin gets absorbed. The first organ it goes to is the liver. And the liver is obviously the largest organ in the body that's producing uh, protein. It also has a very, very rapid cell turnover rate. So if the cells can't proliferate and they die, that's the end of the liver. But it also affects every other um, cell in the body but many of them just don't have that same very rapid turnover rate. Eventually, you will get involvement of the kidney, the heart, uh, and virtually every other organ if you live, uh, in fact, long enough. Just to remind everybody, because I know probably not too many physicians in the audience, we mentioned that the gastrointestinal phase it usually begins 8 to 12 hours, and I'll come back to uh, what may influence that. It usually lasts a day or so, and then there's the so-called honeymoon period. That may not occur in every uh, individual. Some people just rapidly progress, and that honeymoon period can last as long as two to three days. And that's followed by the terminal organ failure phase, uh, which uh, usually starts developing at 72 to 96 hours. And the symptoms can be pretty miserable, usually starting with watery and bloody diarrhea, then liver failure with jaundice and all the complications of liver failure, and that may be complicated by kidney failure. In the severely poisoned individual who is untreated, death usually occurs within seven to 10 days. The important thing to remember is this number down here is not everybody dies. It's this mythology that if I eat one of these mushrooms, the mortality is 100%. It's nowhere near that. And the reason that I'm emphasizing it is this is what creates some of the difficulties in assessing the efficacy of therapy. I'll say a word about that in a minute. So one of the first rules I learned at medical school is that 50% of what they're going to teach us is wrong, and your problem is you don't know which half. And the reality is that now I'm at the end of my, my career, I would bet 90% of what I learned at medical school is no longer valid. And that is going to continue. That's how science evolves, that's how knowledge evolves. And so the same thing is true in the history of amatoxin poisoning. What medical school did you attend? At? A really good one. <laughs> but I can, I, you know, what's, what's really interesting about this is for 10 years, I took an antihypertensive 
that had been approved by the FDA, it had gone through a, a clinical trials that had involved over 10,000 people, it was certified as being effective, and 10 years later, we discovered it had no effect. So even products that have been on the market for years and years that have been, we think, well-researched, uh, eventually uh, may show up with either not being efficacious or have significant issues with it. So let's look at the history of the treatment because this is where we can really learn something. It goes all the way back into the 1800s where somebody made a brilliant observation that there's certain animals that can meet, eat amatoxin-containing mushrooms and it doesn't affect them. Little bunny rabbits, a gray squirrel, um, cats, um, there's some mice. And so the logical conclusion was, well, there must be something that is detoxifying us. So if we take some rabbit guts, maybe some rabbit brains, and we make this nice little <coughs> stew and produce little capsules, that would prevent uh, the serious consequence of amatoxin poisoning. And 50% of people lived, and 50% died, and everyone said, yes, we've got the answer. Well, it turned out that wasn't the answer. But in the early 1800s, it was realized that at least a lot of the early symptoms, especially from the diarrhea and fluid loss, if we replace fluid, we could, especially with uh, some glucose and salts, we could improve the outcome. And that was promoted for a number of years. And then <clears throat> the French, at the Pasteur Institute, the immune system was just being unraveled at that time. Vaccines were being introduced. And so the Pasteur Institute developed, took some uh, amatoxin, injected it into an animal, got a vaccine, and marketed it as serum antifalonique. And this was on sale until 1960, believe it or not. They were still offering this product. And it was <coughs> never shown to be efficacious, except about half the patients who received it recovered and half didn't. The story, by the way, continues. Um, then fluid and electrolyte therapy improved in the, in the uh, 30s and has continued to improve. But I can tell you that the way I was learned, well, the way I was taught to manage fluid and electrolyte probably has changed every five years since I was in medical school. In 1968, this was the big breakthrough. This was alpha lipoic acid, thiotic acid, was introduced, and, <clears throat> and it, it became an investigational drug in the US, and if you had an amatoxin poisoning, you could call the FDA, they would, the, the, the person who was investigating it. Everyone thought this was the answer. And many of us believed it. Um, but it too turned out, that it turned not to pan out. The French, bless their hearts, do some really novel things. And Paul Bastien in, uh, in Paris developed this really strange, I, I, can't even, I, I can't even figure out the logic behind it. This has to be sort of Cartesian thought. Um, but he gave patients big doses of vitamin C, some antibiotics which are no longer available on the market, and carrot juice, and 15 patients survived. And he actually was so uh, convinced about his own therapy that he went live on French television, ate a Floyd's cap, treated himself, got pretty sick, but he recovered. Um, this is no longer the, the uh, standard of practice in France either anymore. Although you can go to websites and find that this is still promoted. This, actually I'll say a word about in a minute. In 1983 uh, was the first report of the use of the milk thist thistle extract silibinin, and that became widely used in Europe, and uh, Dr. Mitchell is going to talk about that in a lot more detail. But then it became clear that if everything uh, or if nothing worked, uh, the only recourse was 
uh, liver transplantation. The first one that I could find on somebody who had eaten amatoxin was in 1985. So what are the key elements of treatment? And you know, this is not rocket science. The first thing we have to do is prevent further toxin absorption. The problem is by the time most patients come to us in the hospital, it's eight to 12 hours, everything's been absorbed. So there's not a, you, you can't pump their stomach. Even if you give them activated charcoal by then, most of it has already left the gastrointestinal tract. Probably the most important, and the thing that has altered the mortality rate most significantly is aggressive, high quality supportive care in a great ice, uh, intensive care unit. Now I hate to report that there are differences in the quality of intensive care units, but there are. And there's no question that the outcome uh, is very dependent on the quality of care that you're going to get in a good ICU. The next is we want to get rid of the poison. Now when we eat amatoxin, it goes <coughs> from the gastrointestinal tract to the liver and into the bloodstream. Most of it gets rapidly excreted by the kidneys. Some of it get attaches to the liver cells and kills them. Some gets re-excreted back into the bile, which gets back into the gastrointestinal tract, and we reabsorb it. So the way to get rid of the toxin is make sure that the, the kidneys are functioning well, and the urine flow is good, and then if there's any way to get rid of it, that, that recirculation, uh, that's another avenue that we can attack. And there are a couple of different ways that that can be done. Pharmacologic therapy to limit the amount of damage to the cells. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about psilocybin because Dr. Mitchell will. Uh, but a whole variety of other agents have been promoted and are still in poison index, and physicians are still advised to use them. Things like penicillin, cimetidine, uh, enastyl, cysteine, all things that supposedly change the way the amatoxin attaches or gets into the, the liver cells and damages them. And then finally, if all else fails, uh, liver transplantation. Just to remind everybody of the biliary system, so here's the, the duodenum, <coughs> the liver, the bile gets excreted into the bile duct, gets back into the duodenum, and then gets reabsorbed. And about 15% of amatoxin uh, is, in that, uh, is in that cycle. So what are the keys to survival? Clearly age, the incidence of the mortality in children, and that's probably on a dose-related basis, because a small child, uh, the, uh, the dose is going to be proportionally much higher because of their, their lower body weight. Clearly the dose is important. Any associated health issues, so if you've already got some pre-existing disease, the rapidity of treatment, and then the quality of the supportive care. What are some of the barriers that <clears throat> we have for patients to get excellent treatment? The first are physicians. Because for most physicians, being confronted with an amatoxin poisoning, it is the first time. They are toxicologic virgins. They've never treated one before. They have no idea what to do. And so their first response is, <coughs> you contact the poison center. Now, th this is good. In the old days, when you picked up a, a medicine vial, I don't know if you remember these days, it said, you know, if this is taken to excess, please call your doctor. Doctors knew nothing, or very little about toxicology, and those have all been replaced now by please call poison control center, because that's where the information resides. Or they'll call a mycologist, who may be able to identify the mushroom and point them in the right direction, but is not experienced with treatment. And then the worst of all is they get on the internet. And the amount of misinformation on the internet is absolutely astounding. When I was preparing for this talk, I went to about 30 sites. There wasn't a single one that provided accurate information. So what happens when you call the poison center, they pull up this chart, because most of them have poison index, 
which gets sort of updated periodically, but is a fairly conservative approach to treatment. And that pretty much will force the physician into using that cookbook approach. And it is a cookbook approach. This is what we recommend. The other problem that the physician is faced with is there's no time to go to the literature or to evaluate any alternatives. You've got a patient that is, if you don't do something quickly, is going to get into serious trouble. So you have to respond really rapidly. So you can't, you don't have the luxury of doing a, a lot of uh, either literature research or even calling many people. And then there's some kind of interesting legal issues that are put in the way. The one is that most physicians want to ensure that they have followed the standard of care. If they go out of the standard of care and there's an adverse outcome, they are immediately liable uh, for, um, for poor practice. And then the second is, in many institutions, there's this, and it's a very valuable committee within our hospital called the Institutional Review Board, which says you can't go and experiment on patients with something new without permission from us. So if a new therapy is around, you have to go through this fairly complex procedure. Now, fortunately, uh, with, uh, with FDA approval, um, and the, the study that, that Todd's involved in, uh, that has uh, mitigated that requirement. But it's very difficult to do anything creative or innovative without going through an institutional review board. Now with cancer treatment, that's fine. You've got days, weeks, even months to discuss it with them. With something like mushroom poisoning, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult problem. So here are some of the challenges that we have in evaluating any therapy that come, comes along. First thing, the dose is almost never known. Well, <clears throat> we've tried <clears throat> to equate it to the length of that latent period, from the time you eat the mushroom to the time you get symptoms. Clearly, the shorter it is, the chances are that the dose that you've had is larger. But it's not always true. You know, all of us who are mycophagists at heart, we're really adventurous eaters. And, and it's not uncommon for people to have two or three different mushrooms that they foraged in the same, uh, in the same stew. And if you do that and there's a GI toxin as well as an amatoxin, your symptoms may develop very rapidly, uh, you know, within hours uh, from, from the, GI mush the GI toxin rather than from the, uh, from the amatoxin. When you go to the literature, there's a real problem because every patient receives different treatment. And in almost every case, multiple treatment modalities are used. It, in other words, the physician throws the entire kitchen sink at the patient. Okay, they'll put them in the ICU, they'll give them fluid, and m monitor fluid and electrolytes, they will give penicillin, they'll give cymetidine, they'll give N-acetylcysteine, uh, they may do duodenal bile drainage, or any combination of those above. And, <clears throat> and going back to try and evaluate which of those therapies have been effective is almost impossible. You just can't separate them out very clearly. Now this is a very serious issue because none of us would want to volunteer for a liver transplant. And the liver is an unbelievably amazing organ. You can cut out 90% of the liver and it will completely regenerate. You can do that experimentally. I did it as a medical student when we were doing some work on, on cell growth. So if you transplant too early, the liver may have regenerated by itself. And as a pathologist, I've been fortunate or unfortunate to review the, the livers that have been taken out for patients with amatoxin poisoning. And at least a proportion of them were still viable. Now, I can't tell you would they, have, would they have eventually died or not, but when you looked at them under the microscope, they clearly were not completely dead. So if you transplant too early, the liver may regenerate. If you, trans, if you wait too long, then the patient may be in such serious condition that it compromises their recovery. Obviously, the availability of a compatible organ 
the quality of the surgical team and post-operative care uh, will influence the outcome. And we don't have great lab indicators of the severity. So <clears throat> if you look, there are at least five or four or five different proposals to win to transplant. Now, if you go to a liver transplant unit, they like transplanting livers. That's what they do. You know, it's, if, uh, if all you've got is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. Um, but if you try and, if you say, what are the best criteria? Uh, we don't have great ones, and there's great variability depending on country. Uh, and they, they're based on the clotting studies, um, the level of uh, sugar in the blood, um, the, how much liver failure there is, uh, and the rate of progression. But every transplant unit develops their own criteria, and none of us have agreed that there's a s single best way of, of doing it. So the approaches that are no longer recommended, we don't recommend any more ground up rabbit brains and guts. Uh, Bastian's method is no longer a, the standard of care in France, um, and that's the vitamin C antibiotics and carrot juice, as delicious as that may be. Uh, thiotic acid has fallen away. A very large review of 2,000 cases from Europe suggested that uh, intravenous penicillin, which has been part of our treatment for years and years, has no proven beneficial effect. Neither has cimetidine. Trying to clean the blood by, by using things like dialysis or hemoperfusion, running it over a you know activated charcoal to get rid of the toxin, uh, that's no longer recommended. Doing complete plasma exchanges is not recommended, and neither is the use of, of steroids. So all of these at some state in the last 50 to 80 years were the accepted um, methods of, uh, of, of handling these cases. And the challenges that we're faced with is that these cases are rare um, and hopefully aren't going to increase, although as Debbie says, the number of mushrooms, uh, and, and especially in California, and for the <clears throat> we never thought that they occurred up in the Pacific Northwest. This year we had a poisoning from a mushroom about uh, five blocks from the University of Washington campus. There's Amanita phylloides now up in British Columbia, on Vancouver Island, uh, and up into BC. So it has spread up the coast. Like the Californians invaded the Northwest years ago, the mushrooms have followed. So because there are relatively few cases, it's very difficult to develop a meaningful database. Now, there's obviously no chance of ever doing a so-called <laughs> placebo-controlled <laughs> double-blind study. That would be unethical when you've got, when you're dealing with something that almost has, you know, has a, a, a high mortality rate. And I mentioned each case is managed differently, and each, then the case series reported in the literature are so variable. Different times, different places, and different therapies. Unfortunately, animal models can't always be extrapolated to humans. They may give some interesting uh, basic biologic information, but the, the, the actual therapeutic aspect of it. Uh, we don't re have readily available assays for amatoxin in urinal blood. We used to have it in my lab in, at Children's Hospital in Seattle. In 15 years, we never got a single request for an amateur uh, blood uh, or you're an amatoxin assay, so we finally abandoned it. And as I mentioned, we really don't have satisfactory criteria about when to transplant. So that, having said all that, <coughs> where are we today? And what's the current uh, recommendation? And for that, I'm gonna leave it up to Dr. Mitchell. Uh, thanks, Dennis. That was really a, a terrific talk. I've got to tell you, um, I, I'm, I'm really in awe of Dennis Benjamin. He um, was one of my uh, uh, 
uh, first early and most trusted mentors when I became involved with amatoxin poisoning, and it's it's really an honor to be able to share this stage with him today. I also want to thank Debbie, of course, and 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 the folks who put on the fungus fair here. This is. Uh, uh, a really just a terrific uh, now Santa Cruz institution and uh, every year it grows and, it, and and by the looks of things it may uh, wind up uh, growing right out of Loudon Nelson Center. Um, it's, it's just packed this year, it's amazing. So I'm, you know, I'm going to try and run through these slides quickly. There's obviously some duplication in some of these slides. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, Dennis has done a really good job of kind of painting the, the picture of, of, of uh, the whole, um, uh, what the whole landscape of amatoxin poisoning uh, looked like when, when uh, I had the, the cohort of patients drop into my lap in 2007. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the good news is I think that we're, that we're really making headway and, and there's really exciting exciting stuff happening and, and we'll share some of that here today and hopefully leave you guys with enough time to answer to uh, get some questions in. So, um, I, amatoxin poisoning, basically most folks who die from mushroom poisoning worldwide, they die of, they die from amatoxin poisoning. There's a, there's a few other uh, types of mushroom toxins that can cause some very serious toxicity. Um, you may have heard an interview on NPR recently with uh, Robert Evans, I think it is? The, uh, Nicholas Evans, the, the author of The Horse Whisperer, who was uh, uh, poisoned with a, uh, uh, a nephrotoxic or kidney poisoning mushroom in, in Great Britain uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, ironically, what got a lot less press is that that very same summer there was uh, there were uh, there was a patient who died um, from picking and eating amatoxin mushrooms in a botanical garden on the Isle of Wight, and and uh, uh, amatoxin poisoning still occur in Great Britain. Um, and the barriers seem to be coming down. The Brits are, are known pr traditionally as a mycophobic culture, uh, unlike their Eastern European brothers who are known as mycophilic. Um, but uh, with, with uh, uh, immigration and, and certainly the uh, large number of, of folks from Southeast Asia who've moved into uh, Europe, as well as here in the United States, um, they've become a new source of, of potential poisonings. You know, amatoxin poisoning, we've known for a long time, is a big problem in Europe. Um, there are scores of deaths there every year. It seems to be worse the further east you go in Europe, but this was really an extraordinary summer. Um, in October, they had a number of poisonings transplants and deaths in Spain, and the following month they had a number of cases in Portugal. Um, and that's, so that's just at one end of the European subcontinent. But what we're, what we're now just beginning to appreciate is what a big problem this is worldwide. Um, uh, amatoxin poisoning, because of the GI symptoms, because of the paucity of care available, um, because the because there's such an uh, uh, a small and undeveloped medical system in on the Indian subcontinent, we're only now beginning to realize what a big problem it it is and ho has always been on the Indian subcontinent. There was a great paper that was published in 2008 by a pediatrician from the Swat Valley in Pakistan, and you may remember the Swat Valley because it was an area that the Taliban took over for a brief period of time. They had, he had 18 patients, 18 pediatric patients who presented to his small government hospital in, in Swat, Pakistan in 2006, and of those 18 patients, 13 died. And, and I, I, I think his experience was not um, an uncommon one. What was uncommon is that it was recognized as being amatoxin poisoning because when you think about it, one of the big killers, especially of children in, in, 
in, uh, on the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, developing world, is diarrheal illnesses. Well, this is a diarrheal illness, um, except that it's a uh, diarrheal illness that has some very serious uh, post-diarrhea sequela, but I think that have been lost in the sort of in the shuffle of of just the whole problem of, of gastroenteritis in the developing world. Um, there were there were 20 deaths in Assam province in India in 2008. I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. We know that there are cases in ev virtually on every continent continent, except for, so far, Antarctica. Um, uh, there have been sporadic cases in Australia, including a uh, death last year. Uh, and here in North America, it's become an increasing problem. And uh, as the mushrooms themselves continue to proliferate, and as you can see by the, by the samples that, that that our fabulous volunteers have brought in, they're very, very happy here in California. They really like it. These aren't little tiny mushrooms barely barely making it. I mean, they, they're really proliferative. Um, a uh, fellow from UC Davis took Dr. Buckwald, my co-investigator, and I out into the field uh, a couple of months ago and, and uh, up in Davenport. And it was really impressive to me, and I'm not, unlike most of, or many of you here, I'm not really a, a mycologist, and, and uh, it was really impressive to me just what an abundance of mushrooms there were out in the woods there in Davenport, and uh, chanterelles growing next to amanitas, and, and all kinds of mushrooms out there, and just how incredibly sexy these mushrooms are out in the field and just how incredibly easy it is to mistake them for other edible mushrooms. And I mean the mushrooms that we have on display here, they don't, they have, they're already missing some of the um, very important identifying characteristics and I, I think it's just incredibly easy to to make mistakes and so I've become really quite a bit less judgmental about folks who uh, wind up poisoned. Now, uh, as some of you know, I, I had a uh, cohort of patients. I had actually never seen a case of amatoxin poisoning and, until, and, and like most, it was the first case that I've, that I ever, first group of cases I had ever seen and, and had I not become immersed in all things amatoxin, it, was pro it would have probably been the last cohort that I would have ever seen in my career, but we had a family who had gone up to Wilder Ranch and picked mushrooms on, on New Year's Day in 2007. And they were led by th the grandmother who was visiting um, uh, f from abroad where, and she was the mushroom expert of the family and she identified and picked, had them pick mushrooms that she knew to be um, delicious and edible from her experience in Mexico. Um, and four of the six family members ended up developing uh, acute liver failure. All six were transferred up to uh, a liver transplant center in San Francisco. And they became our first uh, patients to ever receive intravenous salibinin here in the United States. And um, I, I'm not going to bore you with that story. Um, it is online um, and, and it's been written about. But suffice to say, uh, it, these, were, these were really, I, I think by anyone's standard or measurement, about as sick a cohort of amatoxin poison, poisoned patients as you're going to find anywhere. Um, and, and, and these folks all did extremely well with the uh, management that they received in San Francisco, which included the intravenous salibinin, which was flown here by, by a courier from Germany and, and given with um, uh, the, the uh, blessing of the FDA. Um, these folks didn't, you know, it says here 96 started at 78 hours. It's actually, it was after they, it was 96 hours post uh, ingestion that they started their first infusions and, and all of them uh, made full recoveries of their livers. We had one death 
and that was the matriarch who had led the expedition who died from uh, renal failure. So j just to touch on a couple of points, Amanita phylloides, uh, which is what we have in the basket here and, and uh, of which there's some great pictures around and probably some great samples here at the show. Um, is a European native that um, managed to hitchhike its way here on tree roots sometime probably in uh, the mid part of the 20th century and has, has of, of course, thrived here on the West Coast. Um, the, the poison itself is, I mean, y you've got to marvel at it. It is one of the most remarkable and potent toxins in all of nature. Um, but the, the, by its structure and the structure of this molecule, it's completely unfazed. It, it's, 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 it's what we call a thermostable molecule. So boiling it, cooking it, freezing it, drying it, none of those things inactivates it. Um, and all of our normal defenses for breaking down toxins, so th those, are the fr uh, those are three of them, right? Just in the pr preparation alone, a lot of things are, 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 uh, are uh, defanged, as it were. And then we have our, our, our own defenses, you know, stomach. The stomach is a, an extremely acidic environment. We, we make hydrochloric acid in order to denature um, uh, proteins that we eat. Um, amatoxin, the, the poison, is completely impervious to the, to the acidic environment of the stomach. Human digestive enzymes, are, the proteases, have no effect on it whatsoever. The, once it gets into the circulation, it's not bound to plasma proteins, which is why all of these various and sundry uh, extra, uh, uh, extracorporeal uh, detoxification techniques like dialysis and hemoperfusion, et cetera, um, don't work. Um, it's uh, also not metabolized in any way, shape, or form by the kidneys or by the liver. It is one really nasty molecule. Uh, uh, I, you know, let me. I just want to say one little bit about mortality. Now, it's, it, as as Dr. Benjamin has pointed out, the mortality from amatoxin poisoning, particularly here in the West, in in Western Europe and and the United States and North America, has gone down dramatically um in in the last three decades a a an improvement that i think is we all generally attribute to the improvement in supportive care um uh admitting patients to the to the hospital when they have a good history aggressively hydrating them getting them to transplant centers if necessary etc but w but the mortality is much much lower than it ever was here in the west so the, the approach that we're now advocating is quite simple, and that is, number one, make the diagnosis, okay? It, patients come into the emergency room. Um, uh, it's great having folks like Henry and Phil who can, who can identify the mushrooms, but don't wait for them to do that. And if the mushrooms that they identify aren't amatoxin mushrooms, don't let that distract you either. Admit the patients and hydrate them aggressively. Because what we're finding is that the patients who, who are allowed to develop early renal failure, so what happens is these patients are really dry at presentation. They've had severe diarrhea, severe vomiting, they can't take anything by mouth, they're very, very dehydrated. And that dehydration leads to shock, and that shock leads to a reduction in urine output. Well, that's really important because urine urine output is how we get rid of amatoxin that's gotten into the general circulation. As you, and as you'll recall, I said that about a third of what we ingest winds up in the bloodstream. So our kidneys do a great job of clearing it as long as we're able to maintain urine output. But if this period of dehydration is prolonged and patients don't get aggressively treated early, that renal failure that comes just from being de dehydrated can evolve into a renal failure f from a direct effect of the toxin itself. And then you're really in a, you're really in a world of hurt.
that's big trouble, okay? So we're, what we're trying to emphasize now is really aggressive hydration from the get-go. Don't worry about trying to de detoxify. Don't worry about trying to give activated charcoal or penicillin or N-acetylcysteine. Just concentrate initially on hydrating the patients and giving us a call because uh, we now have the first ever clinical trial here in North America uh, for the treatment of amatoxin poisoning. We are using this medication from Germany, uh, this intravenous silibinin, and uh, for which they've had very good experience in Germany. Um, I think Dennis was the first to point out that its use in, in Europe is not controversial, although its use in Europe is still idiosyncratic and, and, and not universal. Um, so basically, we, we just want folks to hydrate them and call us. And we can get the drug out to any hospital in the United States within 24 hours of that phone call. Dr. Mitchell, could you address how psilobinin helps in these poisoning cases? Okay, well, um, so the sexy thing about psilobinin is that it's basically milk thistle. It's derived from the common milk thistle. So I, I think that it, there's a lot of affinity for, for folks who, who, um, who believe in natural medicine. And, and if you believe in natural medicine, this is going to be one you're going to love because uh, the, the drug itself is basically an intravenous extract of the active component from the milk thistle plant. And what it does is it blocks the reuptake of amatoxin uh, from the bile. So you remember we talked about that enterohepatic circulation and the amatoxin basically hitchhiking a ride with the bile and getting into the liver cells by the same transport mechanism that the bile salts use to recycle themselves. Well, amatoxin undergoes this same recycling and psilibinin blocks that recycling. And w so what we're finding is there's plenty of time to administer the psilibinin. Um, the fact that, we, that it's going to be another 24 hours after they present to the hospital before we can get the drug in their hands does not seem to be crucial. The crucial thing early on is just making sure these folks don't go into renal failure. Now, you could say, Dr. Mitchell, I've heard that there are patients who have received intravenous psilibinin and have still done poorly who have still gone on to receive a liver transplant or who have died. And that is true. Sometimes even solibinin is not enough. And, and patients for whom it's not enough are patients who develop early renal failure, patients who have had a really large ingestion. Remember, we're, we're really good just with supportive care alone. We're going to save 90% of the folks who present with, with amatoxin mushroom poisoning. It's that 10 to 15% who have had a really large ingestion who are going to be in trouble. And most of those we think we can salvage with intravenous solibinin, but there's going to be, a, there's going to be some of those patients who have, who have ingested so much or who have presented so sick that even the solibinin is not enough. And for those patients, we're recommending a procedure similar to what they did with those dogs. Remember the dogs I just, I talked about a bit ago, where they put a, a they put this surgical biliary fistula? Well, we can do that in a lot more elegant way now. We can do a procedure where we put a little uh, sialastic tube uh, into the, the common bile duct and drain out all the bile out through, through a tube that, that comes out through the nose. And by removing all the bile, you're removing, all, you're removing the, the well of, of amatoxin that is accumulated after an ingestion. Because you think about it, you in, first, first all the poison is in the mushrooms. Okay? Then you eat the mushrooms and you absorb the poison. About a third of that poison gets into your general circulation where the kidneys clear it but about two-thirds of it gets into the liver and becomes concentrated in the bile itself. 
So if you remove the bile, you are removing the poison. And, and so we're recommending, re recommending that for the most severe patient. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions. Please, thank you very much. So j just to pick up on that, we would not advise anybody to go down to your local health food store, get a bottle of milk thistle tablets, and go out and eat mushrooms in the hope that you... <laughs> Please, please do not do that. <laughs> or if you do, you'll make for a great story for next year's Fungus Fair. Yeah. All right, I'm going to take another question. Go ahead. She's asking if, if you, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being dying in your sleep to 10 being an excruciating, painful, awful death, where does amatoxin poisoning uh, where is amatoxin poisoning on that spectrum? And I would say it's, it's a lot closer to a 10 than it is a 1. It's not something you want to mess around with. Not very pleasant. Well, gentlemen, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, before you all go off to the next great fungal thing, I want to let you know that there are single sheets of more information on this topic at both doors. There's some right next to Margie on that green cloth over there and by that door as well. And you can go online and find all sorts of more information. And I would like to thank our panel, Dr. Todd Mitchell, Dr. Dennis Benjamin, and Henry Young. And thank you for coming.